there was the first translated book was the book of Luke and the government authorities got copies of that. And so they went into the schools and the clerics and with the kids and said, hey, if you've ever seen this before, you should let us know and that. And so one of the young guys was, I guess, angry at his mother and turned her in. And through that, it just spilled over within hours. And yeah, so the believers were rounded up and then they were sorting through like my friends, our friends, which are just friends and which are believers. Um, yeah, from the believers that we knew, yeah, they were all picked up and then we were deported for life. Hey folks, welcome back to Raw Mission. Do you ever think that missionaries are super spiritual, somehow on a different level to other followers of Jesus? Well, one of the aims of this podcast is to break that myth completely. Those who go are no different to those who stay. We're flawed, we're sinful, we do things we're not proud of. Many of us see ourselves far more like Jonah than the Apostle Paul. This podcast is where we hear the stories of ordinary men and women who've experienced the mercy and kindness of God. And the love of Jesus has stirred us to go, to tell, to serve, perhaps to die. We're very much works in progress, but we're willing to have a go, so we're willing to go. And today I'm joined by John, a brother from Canada who's definitely got an appetite for adventure. He's ridden motorbikes all around the world and has the scars to prove it. He loves water sports too, and that's what he's found himself doing for many years in the Muslim-majority islands of Southeast Asia, turning his hobbies into successful businesses for God's glory. Could God use you in church planting and evangelism in the Muslim world if you're not a theologian or a doctor, an engineer or a teacher? Absolutely. And John's story will show you how. Well, good morning to you, John. It's lovely to have you with us on the podcast. Welcome. Tell us where you are, John, right now, because for me, it's uh, morning here in in, uh, the south of England. But where are you? Yeah, I'm in uh, Southeast Asia, actually uh, Malaysia right now. And Mm -hmm. so here it is uh, just after six in the evening. Uh, I think we're eight hours ahead of you. Okay, brilliant. Well, good evening to you. Tell us where you grew up and your sort of faith and missions journey. I grew up in Western Canada, just uh, about 40 minutes out of Vancouver. Mennonite brother and background. So grew up in church and, you know, through my teen years, just didn't take faith that serious. You know, I was really living to have fun. Me and my buddies. uh, For me, life was about motorcycles in summer, snow skiing in winter. And uh, that's what we were living for, just to have fun. Yeah, and... And uh, life got more serious. After high school, I, I had a 750 Honda. I drove around North America three months, just sleeping out, <laughs> never slept in a bed. And I was alone. And uh, that's where I started meeting people. I, I, I'm a bit of an introvert. And so I just missed having conversations. So just learned how to connect with people and start up conversations and that kind of thing. And so well, that was a lot of fun. Uh, So I did it again the next summer with a couple of buddies, but then life got serious. I had three accidents. I mean, I I was driving motorcycles since I was like 12 years old, never had an accident. And that summer, three of them, the third one pulled my bike off, 900 Kawasaki. And uh, that was in, was in 74, I think. Uh, So this Mm -hmm. is before most people were born. And, uh, and then I started getting serious about life. So I dropped everything. I went to Bible school and three weeks into that, I said, oh, now I got it. Now I got it. And uh, yeah, just one night in winter, uh, I was on crutches because I had a hand gliding accident. Motorcycles I thought were too dangerous. So I got into hand gliding, wasn't <laughs> much safe. And I was just out by myself and I just called it, God, if this is true. Jesus, I need you. I give you my life. And, you know, something happened. And that's where the really, the transforming dynamic with the Holy Spirit started to happen in my life. And I just, that assurance of salvation, you know, I just, I knew I was going to heaven, you know, and not because I'm a good guy. I'm not, not because I deserve it. I don't, but because God is that good in sending Jesus. And yeah, so eventually I went down to UK and again, I bought a, motorcycle. It was kind of a small one, a little 250 Honda, a kind of a half dirt bike. And uh, it was an old one and didn't have much money. And so I just rode, I think I hit almost every country in Europe. And uh, in North Africa, there was, I think they were fighting a war between Algiers and Tunisia or Morocco and Algiers, something. Couldn't get through there. So went back up 
and spent some time in Greece. And then um, just thought, hey, the bike's still running. Uh, what next? I mean, I'm 20 years old at that time. Just didn't have a clue. Bit of a wanderlust adventure. And, how did you uh, afford this? How, how did you afford just to bike around Europe? You know, I always worked as a kid, uh, a German, Mennonite German work ethic in high school. I was, you know, I was delivering newspapers or stocking shelves in a supermarket. And any spare time, I was working, saving money. And then I got this travel bug. Now, you got to remember, this is way pre-internet. Yeah. So traveling was a completely different. You couldn't, there was no Google, you know, to search. There was no Google Translate. You know, you get out there, people weren't speaking English as, as they are today. Yeah. And especially after Greece, then I thought, well, what's east of there? I don't know. So I got a map and I looked, oh, Turkey. Okay. When I got into Turkey, everything changed. And, um, you know, it wasn't considered a Western country and it's a Muslim country. And yeah, then it was just all different. It was exciting as well, but almost no one spoke English. And really, I just needed two things. I needed food and I needed gas for my motorcycle. And I just had a sleeping bag. I slept outside, never slept in a bed. Just, I would eat in a town in the evening and the night. And when it got dark, I'd just ride down the road and then when there was no traffic, no headlights anywhere, I'd drive off into the bush and I'd sleep there. In the morning, I'd wake up and see, see where I was. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And through that, it was really, it was like a honeymoon period with the Lord too. I was just talking to God all the time. You know, there's no one else to talk with. It was either God or my motorcycle. And I was journaling and just reading the Bible and just praying nonstop. And God just was answering prayers. You know, it was like I was a baby, like a mother looking after a baby. And God realized, oh, this guy needs to be cared for. Like he's really dumb and he's <laughs> waddling around out there. So then with hand signs, I could get seafood and I could get gas and stuff. And then I had a little, little FM radio. And so I could listen to BBC in the evening. And I found out there was cholera had broken out between Iraq and um, Iran in that area. So I had to go south, went into Syria then into Lebanon and the border crossings were crazy, you know, because I was Canadian. I had a British motorcycle and I had no insurance. So every border crossing there, you know, they're wanting bakshish bribes or something. And, uh, so it was a lot of hassle at the border and that. And then, um, when I got to South Lebanon, uh, then it got, it got pretty hairy because that was in 76 and a war, major war had broken out between Southern Lebanon and Israel. And I got right into the middle of that. There were out of, there was four military groups all shelling into Israel. And I was right in there. It's too long to tell the story now. But again, just God's grace and my stupidity and God's grace was enough. So anyways, I, then I went back up. I went over to Jordan and to Damascus and went south. And, you know, I really thought I was going crazy. I'd never heard of culture shock, right? And I had no preparation and. I just realized the world is completely different over here. And I remember getting out of Jordan, driving through the desert, and I, was, I got to the Saudi border. And I thought, Lord, I'm done. I don't know what to do. I can't go through another border cross. I can't go all the way back, so I'll go insane. And so I turned around, and later I found out I couldn't have gone into Saudi anyways. So no tourists allowed. But I went back to Aqaba, and I tried to get on a ship going out of Aqaba through the Red Sea, but most of the through the Suez, it was too difficult. And eventually I sold my motorbike in Amman, Jordan, and I got permission, it took three days to go through the West Bank into Israel from Jordan, but the PLO was very active then. And I mean, it's just crazy. I, I won't go into the details, but yeah. And then I got into Israel and again, it was like a different world, but that got my attention. So when I went, I eventually got home to Canada and uh, then I thought, What's with the craziness out there in the Middle East? And I started reading about it and the politics and the religion of Islam. I went into a mosque. I remember in Turkey, I you know you got the call to prayer all the time. Thought, oh, these people are really, really religious. So I went into the back of the mosque and I saw all these shoes. Oh, they take their shoes off. And I looked in and there was no pews. All the men were prostrate. And I mean, I was grubby. And I saw this little kid doing prayers with his father. And he turned around with a shock look on his face. I thought, okay, this isn't the place for me, I guess. But anyways, when I got home, I, I started reading about Islam. and I was really intrigued by Islam and Muslims. So 
that's where that element of, uh, yeah, my life came in. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. Well, then in 81, I broke my neck and again, motorcycle related and God really mm-hmm. spared me. I should have been paraplegic. I was in California. Uh, they flew me up to Vancouver, Canada. And I had the halo brace, you know, with the pins, halo and the pins and the skull and all of that. And had that on for four months and then this a Guilford brace and then soft collar. But it shut me down for seven months just to think and to contemplate life. And I realized, hey, I need to live for something bigger than myself. And that's when I started thinking, maybe God's calling me into missions. So that's what I really seriously said, okay, but where? And so I, I thought maybe I need a little preparation. So I went on a short-term missions trip to uh, the Philippines uh, for two months. I had it turned into four months. And that was really inspiring. I just saw the workers there and what they were doing. And uh, yeah, that God just really rooted that into me. You know, this is what I would like you to do. You know, go into, into the nations. But I also had this nagging kind of thing, a conversation that I was having with the Lord, you know, being in, in Asia, so many people. And I thought, so yeah, I, I've got faith, but the truth of this, is it true? Have I been indoctrinated because I've, you know, growing up in a Christian home? Is it, is it true just because I believe it and I've been taught it? Or is this really true for all peoples, even those that have never heard of Christ? So one day, so I'm in Hong Kong and I'm in a youth hostel in Hong Kong. That's where you get a lot of information in those days. Other backpackers that are going around the world and you're yeah. making notes. Oh, you went there and all that. So, and while I was there, China had just opened to independent travelers. You had to use, go on a tour where, you know, uh, the government led you. They showed you what they wanted you to see. And so I went down the next morning. I got an independent visa for China, took a boat, went into China. And this is the old China and definitely the most difficult country I have ever traveled in. I mean, there was no tourists, no foreigners. You, you just didn't meet foreigners and almost no one spoke English. And you were really on your own. I mean, I, I slept in cities in the back, just buses were parked and they didn't lock the door. So I'd sleep in the back of the bus and just wandering around us <laughs> and, um, you know, on river boats and buses and trains and that. And having this conversation, Lord, there's a lot of people over here that have never heard of Christ. So is the Christian faith true for them as well? You know, they've never had any teaching and uh, never heard of Christ. And so I'm walking down through this town one day and I hear this guy say, come in for tea, come in for tea in English. So I go in, I had to go down off the sidewalk and there was a little tea shop, little hole in the wall place. And I said, where did you learn English? And I, he said, oh yeah, I was studying to be a doctor and in university and that. And then I said some things about communism. You know, in those days, the government told you what job you would have. They prepared you if you were smart. Okay, he was smart. He was trained to be a doctor, but they watched you close. If you were educated and if you didn't follow the communist doctrine, you were a threat. So they deemed him a threat. They changed his life. His, his future now was washing dishes in this little tea shop in this uh, nondescript town somewhere in, in China. And, um, and he knew some English, you know? And so I asked him what his life was like. And I was about to leave. And I said, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? And he says, yes, I am. I am. And he meant he was a Christian. I said, how did you hear it? He said, oh, an Australian couple had come through on a tour and they had brought some Chinese New Testaments. Mm. So they pulled them off as that, and they explained the gospel, gave him a, a New Testament in Chinese, and they took him to their hotel where they stayed, and they baptized him in the bathtub. And then they left. So now he's a believer, but he's indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and he has the inspired word of God. And I said, have you ever talked to another Christian? No. I'm afraid to, because if they'll, if they find out, maybe they punish my parents who are 2000 miles away. So for me, it was like, here's a guy, he's got zero teaching and I'm the first person he's ever talked to. So as I'm asking questions about his life, what his faith journey is, he starts to tell me about this transforming work in his life and how he's thinking, how he's changing that lines up with my life. And then I had my Bible and that he'd never heard of the Old Testament. 
And I ran him some of my favorite songs, you know, King David, some of the laments and that. And he said, oh, that's me. That's me. So God was doing a work in his life. I like what's happening in King David's life. And I walked away. I knew I would never see this Christian brother again. And I just prayed for him. I gave him some money. I said, hey, brother, we're going to meet in heaven. Bless you. And I walked away so blessed, uh, my eyes full of tears. But for me, that settled the question out. Is it truth or is it indoctrination? I was full on, okay, Lord, these people need Jesus. Uh, I want to see more people like this, you know, where you've come into their hearts and changed their eternity. And what is more important than that? Wow. That's so good. Yeah. What experiences. And that for you confirmed, this is what I want to give my life to. And Mm -hmm. yeah. So still though, you're drifting around and seeing what God is up to in a few places, but there's no sense at this point then of joining an organization or finding a team to work long-term. How did that all develop? Yeah. So uh, then I thought, okay, I need some training. So I went to Prairie Bible Institute for two years in uh, Three Hills, Alberta, and it's quite a missions oriented school. Like Don Richardson went there and Elizabeth Mm -hmm. Elliott and some of these people. And it was excellent. And during that time, I read across this book, Operation World. And it, mm-hmm. it tells you about what's happened, how it's happening related to missions in all of these countries of the world. And I ran into this one country. I won't name the country, but it's like an island country. And I knew God was calling me overseas. And I knew it was, you know, to work with Muslims. And there was four points there. And one was there's no known believers there. Uh, there are no workers and no, so no scriptures have ever been translated. And it's a Muslim country. And for me, it was like, it was just like a a switch went off. Like in a light went off in my head. Oh, that's where God wants me to go. So I did a survey trip for one month and went there and I thought, oh Lord, whoa, I don't know if I can do this. And when I was there, I saw these three couples that were unusual and they stuck out. And so eventually I got home and I met a rep from Frontiers and I said, do you know anything about this country? I said, well, it's very sensitive information, but we have three couples there. And I said, let me tell you what they look like. And he's like, shocked. What? How do you know? And I said, I met them. I saw them. I talked to the one guy. So uh, eventually I joined that team and um, yeah. And you know, it was pretty loose in those days. It was like, okay, if you can get a visa to get in, uh, you're on the team. I mean, uh, that's, that's very simplified, but there was no Canadian sending base in those days. So I had three different business plans. And so I went there, I got a one month visa. And in that one month, I realized all of these plans were a fail. And I thought, oh, Lord, I, I got no plan B. You know, I, I was so confident you would call me there. You were going to open the door. And so like now what? And I don't really have a, you know, I've got a biblical background training, but no professional academic, you know, certification trainings. And so I just, I went back to a neighboring country and I just fasted and prayed. And I said, God, I don't know what you're doing. I'm just fasting and praying. And at the end of those days, I just knew one thing. I got to go back. I got no plan, but I got to go back. And it was just, yeah, I guess God's saying, now let me show you what I'll do. And so I, I went back, I met a guy about the second day that I had met a local guy that I met in the first month. And he said, oh, have you ever met my brother-in-law? And I said, no. He said, oh yeah, I think you'd like him. So he took me to his office and we chatted for about an hour and we connected well. And, and then he says, you know, I own two resorts. Why don't you just go to this one resort as my guest, uh, stay as long as you want for free. And if there's a job you'd like to do there, let me know. <laughs> and I'm just, hey. I like your idea. And I recognized immediately the water sports center there was losing money, put it that way. It was all run by locals. In those days, all local guys, no women. It was men's place to work. They'd work eleven months and then they go home for a month. And um I have a background in water sports and that since I was a kid and that. So with like the windsurfing and the kayaks and the sailing and all of that. I mean, all the equipment would just Drone on the beach kind of thing. And so went back after a while and I spoke to the owner. I said, I can guarantee your water sports center is losing money. He says, you're right. 
And he said, oh, why don't you be a uh, water sports manager? And I said, okay. But he says, but I need some qualifications. And uh, are you, you got to be a qualified windsurf instructor. And I said, well, not yet. And so I had windsurfed twice in my life. Once in the <laughs> Philippines and once in another country. So I went back to this neighboring country where I had rented a board. I had no idea what I was doing. Never took lessons. So I'm back there. And I told the guy, can you make me a windsurf instructor? <laughs> yeah. And he says, I can't certify it, but I can teach you to windsurf and I can teach you to teach others to windsurf. And I said, okay, great. So we did. I just windsurfed every day. He taught me. He taught me how to teach others and that. And I took a first aid course and stuff. Um, you know, I needed some paperwork. So he said, okay, I'm going to write you a letter. So we went to a business center at a hotel with his yeah. letterhead. And he told the secretary, type this. You know, this is to certify that blah, 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 so-and-so is uh, qualified to teach windsurfing. Didn't say I was a windsurf instructor, but it said I was qualified to teach windsurfing. So I went back in to the islands and uh, submitted that to immigration. A week later, I had a visa. And then there was a dive school on the island as well. And through that, they had an Egyptian Muslim guy that was the diving instructor. And so he trained me. He says, yeah, I really need help in the diving school. I'll prepare you for the instructor course, which he did all for free. And then I made my Patty scuba diving instructor certification. The next day I went back and I had taught my first course and that kept me in the country visa wise for like 12 years. Of the diving wow. Course. That's amazing. I mean, that's so encouraging as well for our listeners because I do often say to the young guys at, at university here, if they're thinking about missions and they say, well, what do I do? I don't know what my skill set is. I'm no engineer. I'm no teacher. I say, you know, don't worry about it. I was looking for the heart first. And there are many ways. Just get your heart right first. And if you want to do this and you sense God is in it, church sense God is in it, then we'll, we'll work out a way. Yes. Yes. And then in, in those days, I was getting paid US dollars and uh, there was no income tax. So I was taking funds home with me from my account. <laughs> and uh, eventually, once I got married, we needed support as well. If he wants you there, God's going to open those doors, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Sharing this podcast is a really good way to encourage more people to get involved with God's great mission, whether locally or globally. So please do help us get the word out there. If you use an iPhone, it's pretty easy to write us a review, and that has a big impact on how many people can find us. Alternatively, you could share one of your favorite episodes with a few of your friends. Thanks, guys. And now let's get back to the podcast. So tell us about the, that island nation in terms of what were you trying to do in terms of, you know, sharing your faith or the yeah. conversations about Jesus with locals there? Yeah. I mean, it was so many opportunities every day. You know, it was basically, if you want to get to know me, you got to know this Jesus has changed my life. And, you know, my Muslim friends had never heard the gospel and they liked what they were hearing. Muslims like the teachings of Jesus. Love your enemy and do good to those who persecute. That's an incredible message. It's such a high level of teaching. They've never heard that before. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. That to a Muslim's ears, they've never heard that. So they would try to protect us, protect me. In this country, no religion except Islam was allowed to be practiced. And so even the team, we would have to meet on Fridays kind of secretly, you know, uh, sing quietly and that. But we would share with our Muslim friends, this is our fellowship. And they wouldn't turn us in to the authorities because who else is going to tell them about the gospel, you know? And as there were some hardliners, you just need to be careful and you get to know body language and the way they dress, all of that. And you're innocent as doves and wise as serpents. What a privilege to be the first one to share the gospel with people that have never heard. Yeah, there are struggles that go with that. And there were difficult times and there was loneliness, especially I was single in the first seven years and that and it wasn't always easy. Yeah, I'm sure some of the listeners are thinking, wow, water sports on an island somewhere in Asia doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> they could get in on that. Yeah. But what were the challenges for you? You mentioned a bit of yeah loneliness in those early days. I suppose you've got the excitement of being the first believer they've ever met. And, and that I experienced that too all over 
Pakistan and many places. But then there's, I suppose you get the frustration of not seeing a lot of fruit because it's such an early stage for that nation, yeah. those people to hear the gospel. So you have to be patient. Did you find that was a bit tough sometimes? Yeah. You know, there's a lot to learn and experience about persevering, you know, and the years, like we didn't see, we didn't see fruit. And then the first person comes to believe just exciting. And then a few more, uh, and you know, this is before anyone was talking about movements and that. And so some of the lessons were the hard way where you try to bring maybe some MBB, some believers together who didn't know each other or didn't trust each other either. And you realize, well, that doesn't work because it's such a lack of trust. And then they could think, well, what if this person isn't really a believer and will turn me in? So it's much better to, you know, in natural relationships, let the gospel just go through the natural grapevines kind of things through friends and families and in spheres of influence instead of, you know, kind of a congregational model like our church where you, where you bring people together to congregate, that is not as effective. And, you know, maybe learn the hard way there a little bit. And, but yeah, it was just constantly sowing the seed. And I think first Corinthians three, six, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollo's water, but the Lord gives growth and knowing that. And I think now even in movements, what we're seeing too, is move with some of the common characteristics, a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer invested. So we prayed a lot and where these movements started, they can see that there was always workers in the, a lot of sowed had seed had been sown, you know, and then one day a spark happened and God's timing was there, but there's generally a lot of seed that was sown and a lot of preparation of the soil, I think. So yeah, uh, we were kind of at that end. Yeah. And many of our work is uh, in exactly that situation today. Um, what about some of those early believers? Did any of them get found out or discovered and, and face persecution? Did some of them give up on the faith because it was just too tough? Well, we knew that the government was looking for, there was the first translated book was the book of Luke and the government authorities got copies of that. And so they went into the schools and the clerics and with the kids and said, Hey, if you've ever seen this before, you should let us know. And that, and so one of the young guys was, I guess, angry at his mother and turned her in. And through that, it just spilled over within hours. And yeah, so the believers were rounded up and then they were sorting through like my friends, our friends, which are just friends and which are believers. Um, yeah, from the believers that we knew, yeah, they were all picked up and then we were deported for life. That was in 98, but we've been back four times since. <laughs> Computers were also just coming in, in that era. And so I think we slipped between the cracks or whatever. So we're happy to pray with the believers and encourage them and that. So there was a lot of trauma involved. There's still not large numbers and no real fellowship groups yet. I think that we know of, maybe others do, but yeah. So it was a difficult time for them. And so another thing that was really very profitable for us was to have a contingency plan where uh, we all agreed if something like this happened, which was very likely, we wouldn't just go home because if we go home to our church, they wouldn't understand it. So we met with uh, member care uh, for, I think, six days. They came out and gave us counsel, trauma, stuff. And it was incredible. Just every day we could feel the healing. And like, we were absolutely devastated, you know, to see the believers arrested and that. And then telling our stories and, and then seeing, no, hey, God is in this too. God's got a plan. This didn't surprise God. And then our leadership really pulled together and got some advocacy groups together. And then the believers were eventually between three and five months, all were released from prison. Wow. So when we left there after six days, we said, we said, okay, let's all go home to our countries and let's meet, let's meet in six months. Mm. So we met in Europe six months later just to develop a plan. Where do we go from here? And mm. so some of us continued to be involved in that country. Some of us went home or into sending bases or to other countries like us. Myself and my wife went home for, went to seminary for a couple of years, then worked in the Canadian sending base for three years, and then we're in Malaysia now. 
Yeah, great. So yeah, tell us about the, the journey out to Malaysia. How did that happen and what do you do out there? Yeah. So, you know, our experience in the islands was so positive. Our team life was really great. And we just sensed that God's calling us to another country. And so, um, yeah, we got an invitation actually by Greg Livingston to come out. He was living in Bollandwur at that time. Yes. Yeah. So we came out and, um, yeah, we were team leaders as well. And so we went to a part of the country that's 96, 97% Muslim and that's quite conservative. And so again, you know, what are we going to do here? It's all about identity. And we wanted to, you know, build back into the community and that too, you know, being bivocational and that. So I looked at water sports over the first year we spent on language learning and stuff. And then I researched well, what kind of businesses could we do here? And I looked at diving again and, and tourism and everything we looked at, six or seven businesses was either a black hole in investment of money or in time or risk. And so we wanted a company that would be profitable enough. We wanted the main thing to be the main thing, being with people. So we just wanted to invest, you know, 20, 30 hours in business. It should open doors for us and that. And then I always liked sailing. I did a lot of sailing as well. And, and so then I contacted the major brand in uh, beach catamarans and water sports equipment in the world, I would say. And so I got like exclusive dealership. I just sent them uh, an email and said, Hey, I'm interested in buying a boat and, and it may be a dealership. I see you've got nobody in the country. And so we got the exclusive dealership in that country for their sailboats and kayaks and all of that. And uh, the guy said, yeah, we're looking for somebody. Um, if you're serious, fly up here and, and see me. Let's do this face to face. Let's not even do this by email. Booked a flight, spent a few days with him. By this time, you know, I'm 50 years old and I just said, I'm not that hungry. I'm not going to be pounding the pavement. You know, I didn't want sales projections put on me. I want this to be a, a hobby business. I want to enjoy it with my boys and we like water sports and surfing and that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, he gave it to us and it was almost a marriage made in heaven. We just got along really well, ordered my first 40 foot container of sailboats and kayaks and windsurfing equipment. And, rented a shop lot and we were in business and most of our income came from supplying four or five star beach resorts, you know, all of their water sports equipment, training their staff and, and then after sales service. And, and also we had a rental in our hotel on the beach side there, rented sailboats and kayaks and that. And then I would just tell my friends, like, why don't you come over with your family after Friday prayers mm -hmm. and uh, take you sailing and the kids can go on the kayaks and if I invite them, no charge. And so like 30 people would show up, his old family and sometimes a grandmother with food. All of the kids got their cameras, you know, putting pictures on Facebook and we were just known. That was our identity. Yeah. And uh, I was a Malay guy that was a networker and taught him to sail and to fix stuff and it opened the door to the communities. It was more of a rural setting. So very easy to meet people, mm. you know, you meet somebody, you go for tea. Then he sends you a text. My cousin's getting married. Why don't you come to the wedding? You meet half the village there. And yeah, um, yeah it was just really nice to integrate life and business and your faith all together. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge part of what we do now, isn't it? Um, in the old days, if it was mostly education and medical and community development work, I think business is, is definitely the fourth leg of the chair in some ways. So yeah, it's really interesting to hear how yeah, that's worked for you. Tell us though, the differences, because being in Malaysia compared to being before where you were in, in the island country, it, it's a very different scenario, isn't it? You do have an existing established church in Malaysia. Um, so what's your role out there? Yeah, there is a church here and a thriving church. The, the Muslims are 60%. And it's still illegal for locals, uh, Chinese and Indian ethnic background. They're allowed to have churches, but not for the Malay Muslims. So, and they're not allowed to share their faith. And so consequences are, are, I would say much higher for them than for us as foreigners, you know? So, okay. If we get deported, that's happened before. And it's not like we're going to go to jail. 
or that. And so it is more serious for the locals, but it, it's gaining momentum, I would say, where more and more people from local churches are really getting that vision. And yeah, we need to share with our Muslim friends and, you know, they go to school together, they work together, but traditionally they've not reached out. They'll reach out to their own communities and across some of the ethnic lines, but not into the Muslim community. There have been people that have been caught doing that and it's been fairly serious consequences. Uh, we've had a pastor here who was working full-time in that regard and uh, he gave up his pastor role and was working full-time among Malays and he was abducted one day and never seen again. And so we feel that was just a message sent to any others as well. That's not acceptable. Yeah. How recently was that? Just a bit of more than five years, I think. Yeah. yeah. And in one sense, that has rallied the church too. You know, hey, wow, this is serious. You know, we need to take up that mantle. And for others, there's been more fear perhaps. Mm. But yeah, it's been encouraging to see some local believers come alongside as well. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, give us some anecdotes, um, stories of just life out there, whether really tough things um, or just really encouraging what God's up to. Yeah, you know, in both countries we've been to, they practice what we would call folk Islam or popular Islam. It's not orthodox Islam. So when that happens, it's very syncretistic. So when they need power, like Islam, there's no power in the religion of Islam. It's a religion of laws and regulations and that. So when they need power to take curses off of them or curse someone else, then they go back to pre-Islamic practices and they have these shamans. It, it's very powerful and it leads to a lot of fear because people know it's real and they've had curses put on and then they have to go to the local, like in Malaysia, they're called bolos and go to the bowl. You, know, it, you always have to pay for that. And they do incantations and stuff. So just a lot of fear. People live in a lot of fear here in both countries that we've lived in. Fear of judgment, fear of Allah in that sense. You know, the father heart of God is not there. You know, nobody can keep the rules perfectly. And so they're afraid of judgment day, afraid of somebody ruining the reputation or the reputation of their family, a fear of curses, a fear of demonic, the jinn or the old jihad here they call and that. So they live in a lot of fear. They're happy and they they laugh and that too, but there's not that undercurrent of joy. Even when life is far, you have a joy. You know, there's a purpose. There's a purpose, even in the difficult things. And so that's led to opportunities to pray for people. Uh, of course, when you're first there, they think our house is halal and, you know, we have no pork, no alcohol. So they'll eat at our house and we'll share meals and all of that. They think, wow, they would be good Muslims. So of course... Initially, all our good friends are trying to convert us to Islam. And I, I appreciate that. They love us. They want us to be Muslim. They think, oh, you're halfway there, you know? <laughs> and, and then they realize, oh, not so easy. They do have a faith in God. These, they're people of prayer. Whoa. And then, but you live there long enough and you just love them. And then they start to share at a deeper level their problems. And then, you know, there's a lot of contact points with the gospel, whether it's power and, and prayer against some of the demonic stuff. Or it's marriages. Like our marriage is probably one of the biggest contact points we have with the gospel. You know, because an Islamic marriage is quite different compared to a biblical marriage, foundationally. And how we raise kids, let's say. So many opportunities to break stereotypes. Because where we were, none of our friends had relationships with anyone that's not a Muslim. Yeah. Uh, there would be maybe some Chinese business. Like, say, we would, they would pay over the counter but they don't really have a relationship with them. And so we were able to overcome that. They would invite us in and we allow them to get close and we get close to them. And so breaking all of these stereotypes that they knew about us from watching the movies that, you know, from yeah. Hollywood, you know what that's like. Huh? And so, yeah. so many opportunities to share and, and to get into their lives and just love them. You know, we're deep friends and they should uh, reciprocate that. They show us that too. You know, as you go through life together, and yeah. they love their kids like we love our kid. So there's so much common ground and we have a pretty good working knowledge of the Quran and, and using those bridges, you know, from the Quran, starting from where they're at 
what they know. Like Suda 3 says a lot, you know, it says Jesus was born of a virgin and sin never touched. She was perfect. He never sinned. He healed people. He even rose people from the dead. Of course, they don't believe in her death and resurrection, but they believe he's coming back again. I mean, these are great starting points. Right? Yeah, I was going to ask, is there an interest? Because obviously, yes, there's a connecting point over the power and the fear and praying for people. So there's an opportunity for God to show his, his love for them and his power there. But do you also think, you know, with your friends, they, they've gained an interest in scriptures, you share stories and, and make those connecting points through the Quran mm-hmm. into the Bible. Are they starting to be open to reading the scriptures? Yeah. The area we were in is, is the most conservative. And so the interesting thing about this country in particular, like in Indonesia, we're seeing movements there because Indonesia's what, 17,000 islands and, and so many different people groups and workers have been allowed to go into those people. So over the centuries, the gospel has been shared and it's hard for the government, even a Muslim government, to control all of that. Whereas in Malaysia, at least in the peninsular Malaysia, there's only one Muslim people. So it's been much easier for the government. They all practice Islam the same way. And they get any version that's a little bit different, they get suspicious very quick. And ever had workers working up and living among the Malay. A great Livingston did research on that. And because the British didn't allow, when the British were here, unlike the, the Dutch, who largely colonized Indonesia, they allowed the workers to go in. The British never allowed that. They, they could go among the Chinese Buddhists or the, the Tamil Indians and uh, like that, but not among them. That was the agreement they made with the Malay Sultan. Because there are so few believers, they don't know of any who have come to believe. And the cost is very high and they don't know what that looks like. Now, there are those in certain areas that have come to believe and there have been some signs of breakthroughs, but it's sensitive too, so we don't yeah. say too much. But when we pray, we pray a lot for a breakthrough. And it's just a matter of time. Jesus says, I will build my church. So he's going to do it. And we just need to persevere and, and be faithful in that. Amen. Yeah, that's a great place to stop. A- any final thoughts you want to leave with us or a particular anecdote of a person that just you've interacted with that would really encourage us? Um, or, if, or another scripture that sustained you over these many years? Yeah, I remember the early days when we were in the islands. Um, my wife was managing a medical clinic and she was just overwhelmed, you know, a woman in a man's world and not seeing a lot of fruit. And we're just thinking, Lord, is this worth it? Like we're investing so much and we're seeing so little. And I remember the Swiss sending base leader came out and he said, God is as interested in working in your life, in you becoming like Jesus, as he is in you reaching these people that you're working among. And that really hit us powerfully. You know, there's a purpose in us being here. It's about God being involved and working in our lives too. And I know John Stott, leading theologian, died in about 2011. In his last sermon, he said, I want to share with you where my mind has come to rest as I approach the end of my pilgrimage on earth. And it is this, God wants his people to become like Christ. Christ's likeness is the will of God for the people of God. And so, yeah, we're focused on the people we're working among, but God's also for, focused on our lives, making us Christ-like. And this was from the beginning, Genesis 1. You know, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And in Romans 8, 28, 29, you know, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So he's at work in our lives and we're called to be conformed to the image of Christ. And this is an ongoing process. I love that. Yeah, thank you, John. What a great place to end because, yeah, we, we don't want to get caught up by any worldly idea of what success is or mm-hmm. uh, results or numbers. And that's our ultimate destiny too. Yeah. First John 3, 2 says, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. That's where we're going. We're in that process of being transformed. We like him. And we will ultimately be like him. So this is pretty 
important in God's kingdom, in his economy, is that we become like him. And so even in the tough struggles, we can be sure that, yeah, there is difficult, but yeah, God's at work too. John, I better wrap it up. It's been so good to hear some of your stories. Um, I love how God has shaped your adventurous heart and spirit from those early days of just motorcycling around in Europe and North America to and using that for his glory as taking you and your wife out there to have different adventures in different places. So thank you. Thanks for being on the show today. Well, thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's just glory to God. He's been so faithful. Could go on with so many stories of his faithfulness, but what a God, what an adventure. All right. Thanks so much for being with us. Blessings on you. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. For more, check out our website, frontiers.org.uk, our social media platforms at Frontiers UK, or you can email me personally, matt at frontiers.org.uk. Here's a great quote to end with from William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army. Not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go.